So today we'll be looking at uh, exponential functions uh, and the fact that they can be a bit counterintuitive at times. Um, so if you don't mind, um, I'm going to ask you a couple of questions to test your intuition. Okay, okay, warning. <laughs> yeah, all right. So you know that duckweed, uh, which is the green stuff that grows on top of ponds, uh, can grow quite rapidly and, and cover a pond in no time. So let's say that we have a pond and we introduce a little bit of duckweed uh, on day one. Um, and in two weeks, it will be completely covered with duckweed. So how long does it take to cover half the pond with duckweed? Okay, uh, I know. So two weeks, it's, it's full, is it? Yeah. Um, so, I don't know, uh, uh, 10 days? 10 days? No. Um, the trick is in the question. It doubles every day. So on day 13, it was half full because it doubles and then it's full. Ah, of course, right, yeah, yeah. So what if instead of starting with one initial patch of duckweed, we put an equivalently sized one on the other side of the pond and we let it run. How long does it take to cover the entire pond this time? So I'm going to say half because there are double the amount of plants, right? Makes sense, right? Yeah. But no, again, it's 13 days because basically they both have to cover a pond that is half the original size. Now let's go the other direction. Let's imagine that the entire earth is covered with fresh water. How long would it take to cover the entire earth with duckweed? There's, there's, a, there's a trick uh, inherent in this. I can be sure there is. So it's not going to be very long, a year or so. A year or so. I'll, I'll get to a year in a minute. So the first two weeks we go from about six square centimeters to 10 square meters. That's covering the entire pond in two weeks. Uh, then another two weeks and it's enough to cover the entire campus of the university if it were fresh water. Another two weeks and it would cover all of Europe and another week and it would cover the earth. Now you were saying a year and a year is actually plenty of time to cover the entire galaxy if it was covered in water. In fact, it only takes 47 weeks to do so. So our intuition is, is kind of misleading with exponential growth. And of course, part of the reason is because in practice, there's always going to be a barrier. The pond is only 10 square meters, so it's not going to grow beyond that. You know, for humans, that makes sense. We're in an environment where things eventually have to slow down. Another example of this, of course, is, is a current hot topic, uh, the coronavirus. Um, which has an initial growth that is also thought to be exponential. Um, of course, at some point there will be a break because uh, a lot of people will be immune or um, you know, shielded otherwise, say a vaccine. Um, so of course, I'm not a health expert. I'm just talking about the exponential growth bit here and not about all the other things that uh, are important for uh, Corona. Um, so the idea is that there's a growth factor, which is sometimes called the R0. And this R0 value is the basis of the growth. Um, so the duckweed was growing with a factor two every day. Now the R0 value is not defined over a specific period of time, but rather over the infectious period. So if your R0 is three, what it means is that the average person over their term of being infectious will infect three others. So by the time they're better, they will on average have infected three others. Now, if that infectious period is about a week, that means that every week, the number of patients will triple. And this is sort of what we saw in the beginning of, of the coronavirus crisis. So what the duckweed and the coronavirus have in common is that they follow exponential growth. And I think it's a, a good idea um, to train our intuition to write down a very simple formula. So let's derive this formula um, specifically at first for the uh, duckweed in the pond, right? We know that there's an initial value. I already said the value, so let's just write it down. The initial value was six squared centimeters. And then after the first day, it doubled. So that's a times two. After the second day, it doubled again, times two. Now, of course, we need to do this 14 times. I'm not going to write down 14 twos, but you get the idea. So we have 14 times this doubling process. Now, I think almost everyone will be aware of a different way of writing this down. 
uh, which is simply to say we have the 6 square centimeters times 2 to the power 14. And 2 to the power 14 is roughly 16,000, 16,300 roughly. And if we multiply these two numbers, what we get is 100,000 square centimeters. So remember that's the original unit. So this remains the unit and it means that it's 10 square meter. We all know that exponential growth has an exponent. Uh, there's no surprise there, but we can generalize away. Six was our initial value. So we write that down with the letter I. Two, we call our base. So in our case, it was doubling every time period. So that's our base B, in our case two. The time period we denote with T. So that is 14 days. And then the result will be our final value. And this is how all exponential growth works. You have an initial value times the amount of change per time unit to the power time units is equal to our final value. Now, another example of exponential growth that we're all familiar with are, of course, uh, bank accounts and accruing or paying interest. Um, so in this case, the growth is often expressed as a percentage. So how do we convert a percentage to a base? So let's say that we have 3% growth. So obviously that is not the same as tripling every time period. So we don't want to fill in three for B here. We want to convert this to a number that fits there. So 3% growth means that if you have 100%, after one time period, you'll have 103%. Um, so it also means that if you have one unit and you have 3% growth, you'll have 1.03 units. So what you do is you add 100 to get 103 and you divide all of that by 100 to go from a percentage to a number and the value you end up with is 1.03. We talk about exponential growth and the immediate thought is a huge amount of growth when actually I'm thinking 3% not so great. Exactly. And this is the point I was about to make. It's not very intuitive. Um, perhaps that's part of the reasons why banks like to use percentages, because they're not very intuitive, which works in their advantage. If someone says a uh, monthly interest of 3%, you might think that's not a lot, but if you convert it to annual interest, it's actually really a lot. There's another way to think about this, because you can convert basis. So instead of saying we want to have one 0.03. So let's say that you have 10,000 pounds on your bank account and a 3% interest and you're running it over, let's say, 10 years. So this is one way to approach it. I don't know by heart what the answer is, but this will be the amount of money you have on your bank account after 10 years of 3%. But another way to think about this is how long does it take to double my money? So you want to find a value x such that 1.03 to the power x is equal to 2. And it turns out you can use a logarithm to compute this that x is roughly 23 and a half years. So that means that after 23 and a half years of accruing 3% interest you will have doubled your money. Now if you have 2% interest it will take you 35 years. Um, so I recommend, and a lot of people do this when they ask for a mortgage, is they convert these figures to how long does it take to double the money or to pay off the principal, etc, etc. So that's basically what you're doing. You're converting the base and the time period from one format to another. In computer science, we typically use two as the base. Anyone can guess why, right? Um, binary stuff, two to the power, makes sense. So a famous exponentially hard problem in computer science is uh, the Towers of Hanoi. Um, in case you don't know what the Towers of Hanoi is, you have a game where you have three prongs and you have discs that can slide onto the prongs. Uh, and there's one rule and one rule only, which is bigger discs cannot go onto smaller discs. So they always have to have a shape like this. And now the trick is, can you move a number of discs from one prong to the other prong without breaking this rule. So if you have two discs, for example, you can take the top disc, put it in the middle, take the bottom disc, move it to the right, then take the smaller disc and put it on top. 
it gets a lot more complicated if you uh, have more disks. Well, it's not more complicated, but it gets a lot more involved at least. And let's try to figure out why. Uh, so let's say that I give you a way to move K disks. So any number K disks, I give you a way to move them. Now I ask you, can you move K plus one disks? And the answer is actually yes, quite easily, because you take the top K disks, you move them away using the known way, the bottom disk, you can move it now because it's free, and then you take again the K disks and you move it on top of the now moved bottom disk. Now this algorithm is very nice, but it has the downside that you had to do the moving the tower of K disks twice. So every time you add one disk, you need to do the problem for the previous one twice. So we can actually write down the formula for this. Um, so we know that it doubles every time you add a disk. So the base is two, again, computer science, and then the number of disks, let's call that N. So two to the power N, that's how much time it costs. Now, what we notice here is that time is actually our final value and the number of disks is our exponent. So it's kind of flipped um, from the problems we've seen before, but that's perfectly fine. Our initial value is how long it takes a computer to move a single disk. So let's say that you build a computer program to do Towers of Hanoi. You can ask Torsten how to do it in one of the computer file videos. But let's say that it takes about a billionth of a second uh, because a computer can do dozens of operations in that time. That is one nanosecond. And then you can do two to the power n operations and that will be our final value. Now we are free to fill in a value n and ask ourselves how long will it take a computer. So if we fill in a reasonable value like 10, 2 to the power 10 is 1024. So that's a nice value because it's roughly 1000. So that means that we can do 10 disks, a computer can do 10 disks, I can't, um, in 1 millionth of a second. It can do 20 disks in a thousandth of a second. It can do 30 disks in a second. Okay, so you think, okay, that's fairly quick, 30 disks per second, um, but then if we move to 40 disks, it will take a thousand seconds, which is, you know, almost 20 minutes. Then if you move to 50 disks, well, you get a thousand times 20 minutes. So that's in the order of magnitude of several weeks. Then if you go to 10 more, 60 disks, you'll get again a thousand times that time span, which will be in the order of magnitude of centuries already. Um, and then, of course, if you go beyond that, you know, before you reach 100 disks, the universe will have died a black death uh, or whatever it's called nowadays, a big crunch. Um, there's just no way that a computer will be able to compute this. But then you might say, okay, what if we make the computers a bit faster, right? What if we, instead of having a gigahertz computer, we have a, a petahertz computer? So it will be a thousand times quicker. Well, all that means is that it can do 10 disks more than the previous computer. You might say, what if we are smart in the algorithm and we have some shortcuts and we can save 99%, 99%, okay, that's a factor 100. Uh, so that means that you can save about six or seven disks. And this is the big problem of exponential um, algorithms in computing. Uh, now, in the case of the Towers of Hanoi, it's not a practical problem because why on earth would you want a computer to, to, to tell you exactly which disks to move for 100 disks? That just doesn't happen. Uh, but there are famous problems that we believe are exponential that are of interest. A famous example is the traveling salesman problem. So let's say that you want to visit, uh, say, 20 cities in the UK and you ask yourself, uh, can I do this in one week? you know, following, you can use public transport, you can use the car, whatever, can you do this in a week? And in general, there's no easy way of finding this answer. One naive way to do this would be to look at all combinations of cities, and that is exponentially many combinations. So that means that if you add one city, you have to now consider all permutations that include this one city. So that means that it will be more than two times as hard every time you add one city to the problem. And that, of course, is going to run into the same issues here. It doesn't really matter what the initial value is. It doesn't really matter what the base is. If you have an exponential um, function, it will always get out of hand at some point. 
Now, in the case of the traveling salesman problem, this is a bad thing because we would like to be able to compute uh, you know, faster ways of traveling. That would be nice, wouldn't it? But in the case of computer security, it is actually a good thing sometimes that it's difficult to compute certain problems. Um, if you have, for example, a 2048-bit key, what it means is that there's two to the power 2048 different key possibilities. So if you start guessing keys, you can go multiple runs of the universe just guessing random keys and you'll never even get close to guessing the right key. That is the nature of exponential distributions. They can go up really quickly, uh, much more quickly than we can understand thinking about it naively. But by simply looking at a formula, we can get more informed uh, ideas of the speed of the growth. I'm hoping one day my bank account interest will get out of hand. That's the, that's the hope. Yes, so I don't know if you've seen Futurama, but um, if you have a thousand years worth of interest, you have a lot of money. Unfortunately, the world government will have collapsed a couple of times, so it still ends up worthless. <laughs> here, this one back. So I know the trick, huh? This one here, ha, and it all works out. Which is keeping track of time. In that way, we'll get really confused and we basically get the millennium bug all over again. There must be a way of fixing this. Are people working on it already? 